start recording. Um, we have to start over again just for a minute because uh, we haven't. We I didn't activate the recording like I'm supposed to. So uh, this is Eric Harrison uh, starting our broadcast today, uh, which is 3:22, uh, 2017. Brought to you by Smart Dog Productions, WFLHCA. And as you know, we're committed to uh, IBM Watson, and uh, this is thematic of that, as well as we have our own uh, plaque probe uh, that's called Sherlock, so Sherlock and Watson together. Uh, the case today is the case of the St. Lucian Lad, and so this is the St. Lucian Harbor. The islands go from Cuba to Puerto Rico and wind around in sort of a curved reverse sea that comes to Venezuela, and uh, near Barbados is an island called St. Lucia. And so our gentleman today is a 31-year-old Hispanic male from St. Lucia who is not in atrial fibrillation. He's in the Air Force and reported for clearance for airborne duty. He has a history of having a syncopal episode uh, surrounding micturation, whether it's uh, post hoc ergo hoc or where it's, whether it's due to micturation, I can't tell you. He has a history of sleep apnea and uh, CPAP use. Um, I'm not sure how he was diagnosed with sleep apnea. I don't think he really had a sleep study. He uh, used to smoke five cigarettes a day for about five years, quit three years prior to presentation. He has uh, some increased cholesterol, which will show you some numbers, and some bilateral lower extremity paresthesias. I'm not sure the origin of that. He's uh, on no medications. His father had some hypertension. There's no family history of any heart disease or sudden death. He's had some palpitations in the past irregular heartbeat, some shortness of breath and pounding of his heart, not occurring very often, occurring rarely. And so uh, let's see what we can make of this. Physical examination is very brief and shows that uh, he's a pretty normal size. SAO2 is normal, heart rate is normal, blood pressure is normal, and his physical exam, as well as his cardiac exam, is entirely normal. Which brings us to his EKG. This is a very weird looking EKG. One, you wonder about the leads, but then you look and they're probably leads are okay. And so then you wonder about this P wave axis, and this is probably some kind of junctional rhythm. Uh, it's a slow rate. This is not uncommon to have a wandering atrial pacemaker and have a junctional rhythm. A uh, young guy who uh, probably has high parasympathetic tone and uh, probably has a high vagal activity. And so that takes, you don't have to worry about that. And then you look at this uh, sort of repolarization pattern uh, that's very bizarre looking. This certainly gets your attention. And with his upward cobed ST segments uh, across the precordium, there's nowhere that the T wave and the ST segments are not influenced in some way. So it's very diffuse. You might think uh, pericarditis, but it's more weird than pericarditis. You might say interventricular conduction defect. Looks like it's uh, a terminal defect, yet uh, there's some atypical features, but there is a, a small Q wave in AVL and a small Q wave in 1, and so that means the septum is depolarizing from left to right, which is the correct direction. And so very peculiar looking EKG, uh, and uh, certainly warrants a referral to cardiology uh, for sure. We've got Pooh coming on, and so I'm going to unmute her and center an audio pin. And so the EKG is the essence of this case. And so uh, let's see what else we can make out of this. And uh, if you have any comments, uh, I'd love to hear your comments about the EKG. And uh, maybe we'll get some comments from Pooh when she comes on. And so as we move on through this EKG, uh, we can uh, look at something uh, called Brugada. And uh, this is one of the Brigada classifications. And uh, you can see, and now we have Poo up. Hello, Poo. How are you today? Good morning. Poo, you want to take a look at this EKG and tell me what you think? Uh, this is person of Brigada kind of fact. This is uh, somebody that just uh, is a 31-year-old gentleman. Let's go this way who uh, basically is in the Air Force. He's from St. Lucia, 
And so it's the case of the St. Lucia lad uh, to keep with our Sherlock Holmes uh, mystery case theme. And uh, he's had uh, syncope once surrounding micturation, sleep apnea perhaps. He's on CPAP. I don't know who would use that without a diagnosis of sleep apnea, but I'm not sure he had a sleep study. And he has some palpitations, irregular heartbeat, and pound of his heart. But the main reason, and some lower extremity paresthesias and some elevated cholesterol. The main reason he's here was uh, he wanted to be a parachute guy, and he was turned down because of his EKG. So what do you think about his EKG? His, it's like P waves are inverted, which is kind of going for some kind of ectopic atrial rhythm. Then his STs are T-wave inversions are prominent, and in V1, V2, they're up. They're like slightly coved, maybe. Um, could be. The, is this the only EKG we have, or is there well, some the other? Same, so I didn't show any others. They're all, except for this. And the P-wave, he has a normal sinus rhythm on his other EKGs. So he must have been a little old on this particular day. The STs are up in V1, V2, which could be with, with his age and syncope brugada as a thought. Um, so it's a weird early repolarization at the least. Yeah, yeah. at the least. And so, uh, so I, I got I put a brugada 2 up here and thought I would superimpose it next to there. And it certainly doesn't look like a brugada 2. And so... But uh, with his palpitations, his history of syncope, you certainly worry about something in the way of a channelopathy. And uh, so let's see what we got uh, there. He did have an echo, and he's, uh, I've never done an echo this way. Have you ever done an echo this way? I usually, I'm usually on the other side. Yeah, mostly on the other side. Hmm. Maybe they're doing this just for the picture to show that uh, you can see the position and so forth. Maybe they just did this for a, a representation uh, of a picture. And so, but he has normal ch chamber sizes, normal LV contractility, and uh, a trace of this and a trace of that, which is normal. RV systolic pressure is 35, which is normal. And so we didn't find anything with ZKG. And uh, it was unremarkable. And he was in a normal sinus rhythm when we did his EKG. And so we did a CIMT. We just routinely do this in screening for coronary plaque. We find a lot of plaque in young people, certainly people in their late 30s, early 40s, males, females. Everyone's got uh, carotid plaque. And so it's very, very common. And so here you can see uh, some uh, deposition of some coronary, carotid uh, plaque here with this thickening. Uh, on the uh, carotid intimal medial thickness. This is not him. He was normal. And so I just want to show you that we do do this routinely all the time. And uh, the correlation with coronary artery disease is about 35%. It's about the same as the femoral arteries. The correlation there is about 37%. And so it's a useful screen for me. And I'm so surprised how many females in their late 30s, early 40s, have some thickening and some plaque present in their carotid arteries. I'm very surprised about that. And you can watch the changes over time. And you can put them on a statin. And you can watch the changes over time with a statin as well. And so it's a nice window to understand atherosclerosis a little bit. And so we did do some lab. And uh, this is a picture of Elizabeth Holmes and Theranos. This is the lady who went from uh, having a... Uh, $400 million to having nothing, uh, and it was sort of a, a sham. Uh, and so, but I thought I'd just uh, show you his cholesterol is 243 with an HDL of 57, LDL 167, triglyceride 71, homocysteine level 9.4, calcium normal, potassium normal, don't have a magnesium, his creatinine is 1.1. So what to do at this point? So we've got Echo cath nuke, stress echo, Lexi PET, which is also a nuke, cardiac CT, EPS study, signal average EKG. And so, Pooh, would you like uh, to?
to tell me what you might consider doing. And uh, that, there's no right or wrong here. There just is. And uh, there's several ways to go about any workup of a patient. So, Poo, any preferences? Brugada. Any things for you? Brugada, I mean, we could try and induce it, do a procainamide challenge or something and hook him if we see a pattern or... Okay, so let's take a look at that. And so here's the Brigada workup, and we're talking about channelopathies. And uh, here we've got uh, just a sort of a schematic. You've got to have something in your mind when we talk about these things, and especially as a cardiac imager, you like to see images. And so here's a suggestive image of a channel that might be on the outside, it's open, and then on the inside, it's closed. And then this one's open in. Uh, on both sides, and this one's uh, closed on the outside, open on the inside, and so there's various options that a channel will have, and you can picture channels in different uh, fashions, and you can see some uh, something going through the channel uh, on its way inside the cell. And so we have uh, some cartoonish pictures of what Brigada is like, and here's a type 1, and there's a type 2, and he doesn't look like he fits any of these when I look at it. And so here's a, a classical Brigada EKG on a patient. And uh, they also have ST segment elevation. They also have a terminal conduction delay. Uh, this one doesn't seem to have the normal activation of the septum from left to right. Does not have it. There's no Q wave here, here, or V5 or V6 uh, that I can see. And so, so, you know, this EKG could or could not be. Um, there you go. It's more common in Asians, uh, as everyone knows. And so let's flip back through here. Hello, Teresa Stone. And so we'll flip back through here. And Teresa is on. And so let's go back through this way. And uh, Teresa, we're presenting a case for you, your group. Uh, of a 31-year-old who has a very strange-looking EKG, some palpitations, irregular heartbeat, and pounding of his heart. And he lives in St. Lucia, or he did. Now he's in the Air Force. And uh, we're going to go back through here. Funny-looking EKG. And uh, we talked about a little bit about Brigada. And uh, this is uh, this is the pattern. I don't, we don't see a lot of Brigada in Tampa, Florida. We don't have uh, a lot of Asians in Tampa, Florida, and so, but we don't see a lot of Brigada. We can, not from lack of looking for it, and not from lack of seeing pseudo Brigada, but never really confirming uh, that someone has this. We actually put a defibrillator in someone that never had a problem and never had to be defibrillated, but he had an EKG pattern, and everyone was very suspicious, and he had a history of syncope. And so, the Brigada brothers, can you imagine three brothers and going into EP, all three becoming EP specialists, and each one having his own center in Europe. And so we've got uh, the younger brother, Ramon, who established the genetic underpinnings of the so-called Brigada syndrome. And we got Joseph and Pedro, and Pedro uh, was the Brigada guy, basically, and Joseph was involved as well. But Pedro was the originator. And then uh, they came up with this in Europe and Belgium and came uh, started seeing Southeast Asian cases recorded by the CDC uh, since the 1980s and some infant sudden death syndrome, SIDS, and uh, apparently five in 10,000 are affecting the United States, so we ought to come across a couple of those in our careers, and uh, four times that in Southeast Asia, 12% of sudden death, and so in the United States, uh, most of sudden death is from Hokum. And Italy, it's arrhythmogenic, arrhythmogenic right ventricular dysplasia. And uh, it seems that Southeast Asia, the Brigada syndrome, is a very common cause of sudden death. So it certainly varies with nationality and ethnicity. And so there are the Brigadas. This is the oldest brother here. Done a lot of research. And genetic... Uh, People were clinically diagnosed with Brigada because of their EKG abnormality, but uh, this can be unreliable as it's been with me and hasn't predicted uh, uh, someone having uh, sudden death or arrhythmias 
uh, in my experience with the cases I've seen. Uh, genetic sequencing uh, may be helpful, and there's an SCN5A, which is a sodium channel gene that appears to be causative, but there's a lot of these genes, and there's 3, 300 mutations, and there's 23 that seem to be responsible in Brigada. And so it makes you wonder what uh, channel proteins, uh, as you know, uh, act as gates into the cell membrane, allow specific ions using sodium, potassium, calcium to flow in or out. And so the ion tides create the electrical impulses that trigger muscle movement. And the heart relies on this for electrical signals as well to signal contraction in a systematic uh, way. And so um, we can uh, look at uh, some uh, concept of what these channels looks like. And we've got a is the potassium channel, and B is the calcium channel, and C is the sodium channel. So we talk about channel inhibitors and channel uh, 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 exciters, and, uh, and so these are what we're talking about, what the uh, alpha subunit, beta subunit, gamma subunit, delta subunit, and uh, beta subunit, uh, alpha centrophin, caviolin-3, Anchorin, cytoskeleton, and cytosol. And so these are the things that we talk about. And then here's a picture, pictorial representation of a very complicated thing that's this channel. And so you should have some concept in your mind of what's going on because you're going to read a lot about channels and see a lot of channels. And so there's myelofilaments that are being activated. And then here's sodium coming in this little uh, channel. And then here's the other channel with potassium coming in there. And then we've got ways of potassium to get out. And here's an exit for potassium, another exit potassium, exit. And then uh, here's an entree for calcium. This is an exit for potassium as well, entrance for sodium. So this is like an exchange. Potassium goes out, sodium goes in. Uh, this is a sodium in. And so uh, these are very complicated. And, uh, and they put the receptors all around here just to give you some idea. And it has to do with uh, sarcoplasmic reticulum and activation of the sarcoplasm. And uh, we get calcium involved very intimately in this. And here's a junction and a triadin. And so that's, those are the basic concepts that you need to keep in mind. So uh, CRISPR-Cas9 may simplify the designation of the correct gene. And uh, this is uh, basically really high-tech technology that's extremely important about how you can actually edit DNA uh, by cutting a, out a piece with the CRISPR concept and uh, editing this DNA, uh, taking a slice out, putting something else in, and uh, the donor DNA, and then putting that anywhere you want to make whatever you want to make or to observe whatever you want to observe. And this is basically simplified a thousand times what we used to do uh, when we would target DNA and try to put something in or take something out. And this is uh, Jennifer Dudna, who uh, will probably get a Nobel Prize for this along with uh, some other people. And uh, there's a real battle about who has the patents, and Berkeley is battling uh, somebody in Boston over the patents. Uh, and so we're not sure where, how that's going to end up. But this has become uh, a multiplier of papers, and everyone has jumped on this. And there must be a thousand papers coming out a year uh, using CRISPR for editing. And so this has become the supreme way of editing uh, genes, and it's a way also that we can uh, differentiate uh, channel lopathies and what's going on and be able to define them um, more carefully than having to randomly uh, sequence everything and uh, try to figure out uh, which uh, SCN5A is involved in the particular muta mutation that we're looking at. And so, so that's, uh, that's extremely important. You'll hear a lot about CRISPR-Cas9, the name of the game uh, in genetics and total game changer. So we did. We did send a patient uh, to Dr. Herwig and uh, basically he did an EP test. And so here's this innocent guy with uh, some uh, very light symptoms 
who uh, has this very, very bizarre EKG, who has no evidence of sinus node defunction, dysfunction. Well, we didn't think that. You know, we did see perhaps uh, ectopic atrial focus or junction rhythm or something. And uh, but that happens with agatonia, and no evidence of AV node dysfunction, and no evidence of his Purkinje dysfunction. And even though it's got uh, some kind of IVCD, in a particular conduction defect, and no inducible SVT or VT, and as you suggested, a procaine amid challenge, and the procaine amid challenge basically is a normal response. So there goes Brigada out the window. So we still got a crazy looking EKG. What are we going to do next? And so that's up to you, Pooh. What do you think now? Hmm. Seems to be, I mean, we could still do a hold or event monitor to see if we catch something, like not just in VTs or something, and we can make a case for yeah. further a CTA to rule out a congena, like a coronary and all something funky. Okay, so let's, uh, here we are at coronary CT, our old friend. So let's, uh, let's take a look at coronary CT and see what that tells us. So hang on here for a minute. And we'll go to our coronary CT, and here we are. Voila. And so here is the object of our interest. So rotate this around and look at it. And uh, see uh, the 3D volume rendered image that you've gotten so used to seeing. And uh, that looks pretty good. We can take a, take a little better look at the origins of the coronaries. And so there's several ways of doing that. We can take a swipe at this and uh, take a quicker look by looking down this way. And, uh, well, it looks like that's coming off right where it's supposed to. And then the other one, not as easily seen, but it's can't really tell where that is, but let's see if we can expose it a little better. And if we can't, we'll come up with a, another view to look at it. So let's come across here and remove that and see if we can see the origin. Ah, it's coming right across there somewhere. And we'll come around this way. And there it is. Voila. So that also is coming off at the correct place. So we no coronary anomalies. So uh, let's take some more looks. See what else we can find. Hang on just a second. I'm going to trim this just a little bit more. I can see back in there because it's in my way. There we go. Now we can see much better. And so uh, we can see some deformity. 3D volume rendered is very useful. We're just looking at, see if there's any remodeling. And we see this big lump here. You see the lump, Pooh? I do. Yeah, so there's a big lump there. So, uh, and it's on the, I guess, septal side, you might call it. It's on the uh, aortic side. And uh, looks like what you see when you see an atheroma or coronary calcification or something. And everything else looks pretty good. So let's go take a look at that and see what, what the story is about that. We'll come over here and we'll go inside the vessel. And we'll magnify, make it very big. We'll move stuff around a little bit. And uh, then we'll do some cross sections with the transverse. Very useful. And we'll make this all like this, and then we'll color code it. Here goes the lumen, here goes the wall, here goes the plaque. And so here we are. So, uh, Pooh, any observations you'd like to make about this guy? I'm going to come down and, and, and get the transverse sections of this image. Let me get this out of the way. And move this over here. Assembly. Yeah, I'll put this over here somewhere. There we go. Okay. 
And now we're coming across here. There we go. And so we've got sort of squaring off this side uh, and uh, where the calcium is. That's probably an artifact produced by the software. This is old software, 2004. And so basically here's our very big linear calcification that you can see with definite, you know, 20% remodeling, looks like, maybe even 30% remodeling. Yeah, it could be 30% remodeling looking at this vessel. So usually we see like 10 or 11% remodeling, and this has got a very strong remodeling. So um, that's it. And it doesn't look very complicated. It just looks like a linear calcification. Let's take this uh, picture off of here. Look how symmetrical that looks. Actually, it looks like a, a staple or something. If, you, if somebody had surgery, you say that's a staple. Got left in there. So, Pooh, any comments about this uh, odd-looking, very linear, straight, looks like a straight line? Yeah. Comments about yeah. that? That is weird. I'm measuring it here. Coming down, measuring that. Got 1.2. See if it goes, it goes further down. It does go further down. Yeah. That's at least 1.2. So, and uh, frequently we see calcification. It can be on this side, it can be on that side. Usually it's on that side, the diagonal side. This time it's on the septal side. And it just, uh, just at the end of the main left, beginning of the left anterior descending. So let's go around and look and see if we, you know, if this uh, is just an example of garden variety atherosclerosis, if we see any else, well, it's the same piece, and don't see anything on that diagonal. And we look at the next diagonal, and our ramus, and then this branch of that ramus, little tiny circumflex, Take a look at that, okay, and uh, what's that up there? Oh, that's the same thing, okay, same thing seen in a different way. All right, distorted. So let's go over to the right and see what the right looks like. Got a little misregistration here. Come down here with the right and uh, I don't see any little misreg. Can't quite get it where I want it. Let me see if I can trace it down to where it's supposed to be. Trace right there. A little better. And so that's it. So no coronary anomalies and uh, this linear calcification. So um, any comments about about this who in terms of what's going on with this patient? Are we looked a little different? What about the RVD? Can we get better shots on the CT for right ventricle? Yeah, so uh, well we looked uh, also around and here's the coronary calcification. You can see quite well that we're looking with our calcium scoring software and I just sort of it's of course it's got contrast in here but uh, I dampened it down in terms of the image so we see uh, how bright the calcium is and so here's our linear calcification that's seen but uh, also we have some other calcification here's a, a neighbor over here that's some calcification in the lung parenchyma and so here's a piece over here and there's another piece there so in the lung parenchyma, we have a couple pieces of calcium and this big piece of calcium. We can pretend to score it if you want to and circle this to highlight it, make it look prettier. There it is. And, uh, and we can do that over here with this color, nice color. There it is. And then 
There was another. There it is. There's another piece over there somewhere. Yep. So we've got some, uh, that has to be granuloma, right? Uh, I don't know how, uh, you know, you calcium in the lung parenchyma, if it isn't uh, asbestosis in the diaphragm or if it isn't uh, granuloma is what I think of when I see that. Of course, we see it usually in the hilum and see old histoplasmosis, oxidio. So that's it. That's So let's see if there's anything else to be made out of this. And of course, you can use these to triangulate. If you want to try to put them in a plane, you can attempt to put them in a plane. I think you can do that. Well, let's go back over here and see if there's anything else to be made out of this. And uh, here we are in black and white. The three pieces of calcium showing up almost at the same time. Two of them next to each other in the lung. And then one in the heart in the left hand two descending. And, uh, let's, well, that makes you think about, let's go look up. Uh, histoplasmosis. You, certainly we always go look at the spleen and uh, see if we can see any calcium in the spleen. This doesn't give us a good view, but we'll find another view here in a minute. So let's go see what we can do about that. Uh, back to a viewer. Back to the gallery. Let's go back to this software. Let's go over here. Let's go look at spleen over here. There we go. Here's our here's the spleen. And so we'll have to magnify that a little bit to see. Here we go. Let's look over here. This is a better view. And let's get rid of the coronaries. And uh, let's concentrate. And of course, we got contrast. So you know, don't forget we got contrast floating around here everywhere. And so. Let's get a mag magnification on the spleen. Let's see if we can get our image up here. There we go. And so then let's go through the spleen and see if we can see anything. I don't see anything there. I think I see contrast. Yeah, I see contrast. There, there's, there's a density. Brighter density than contrast. Wow, we found something. Right there. Let's make a picture of that. There's a piece of calcium in there. I don't know what part it's in. Can't tell if there's other calcium in here. If we go back up this way, that could be calcium. Put this into calcium scoring software, into here, go down to the spleen. Here's a spleen. There's a spleen. And then we can dampen the whole thing. And try to get the right density. So there is a, looks like a splenic artery calcification, and there may be some other splenic calcification. Don't see any calcification in the kidney. Don't see anything in the gallbladder. So there is a little bit of calcium that we found in the spleen, a couple areas. So. Um, well, histoplasmosis is Ohio Valley, so we're not going to say that he's, he's probably never been near the Ohio Valley. And so we're not going to say that's the reason. And so, but you do get that in the spleen also. But there are other diseases, and so we'll have to think about granulomatous diseases. Let's go over this one more time.
survey the spleen, spleen one more time here. So a couple little splinting calcifications we did see. But remember, we do have contrast here. So let's move on after having seen that and uh, see where we're going with this. Uh, and I don't see anything else to remark on. We did look and see uh, about myocardial blood flow. And so we can give you a CT MPI on any case that we do that has been challenged with nitroglycerin as well as with contrast, both of which are vasodilators. And so with that, we can let you see what that image looks like in terms of iodine distribution. And it should be normal, and there's usually some noise, and the noise occurs from several areas, from beam hardening and also from some phase boundaries. And so there's nothing remarkable here and other than artifact. So let's go back uh, to our search or reality here and uh, see what we can glean. And so we've got a significant degree of positive remodeling in this patient. Uh, so I thought I would show you a little bit about positive remodeling. And so we have basically uh, a normal vessel and then uh, this vessel gets a plaque inside and uh, it can go to no remodeling, which is the same vessel size, uh, or it can go to inward remodeling, uh, where the vessel size appears to be uh, about 10 or 15 percent smaller. Or it can go to positive remodeling, and the entire vessel grows and gets a lot bigger. And look at this, uh, actually the lumen in this one is overcompensated, aneurysmal. This one uh, is pretty good. It's about the same. So this turned out to be a nice remodeling, keeping uh, the channel open and keeping the channel the same size uh, and yet uh, living with a plaque and so, um, and hopefully not plaque rupture. And so, so we have positive remodeling in this patient and uh, this occurs as a homeostatic response to changes in flow and stretch and uh, to restore normal shear stress and wall tension. There's lots of things going on here with matrix metalloprotonases, MMP2 and MMP9.14. Nitric oxide seems to be part of this process, which was the molecule of the year about 15 years ago. And uh, this is all going on. The smooth muscle cell apoptosis, low flow states, factor beta, cross links, all this stuff is going on in this. So most of the remodeling is shear sensitive remodeling, stretch responsive, significant interaction between stretch and shear signals. And so here's a Yap and Taz are involved in forming vessels. And here's an example of Yap and Taz being involved in the fetal development of coronary arteries. Um, but they also uh, are involved in remodeling. And uh, these are basically mechanosensitive molecules that cause biomechanical uh, changes uh, which induce uh, vessel remodeling. And so, and then there's some channel things that are going on, which is piezo-1 and piezo-2, which have to do with changes in vessel size, and shape, morphology from changes in pressure and this is the Yap and Taz operating in the nucleus of the vessel to cause a remodeling due to compression and expansion that's taking place. And there's shear sh stress, membrane tension, stretching. So we got the shear stress and the stretching all taking place. We've got adhesion down here, substrate rigidity, and, uh, and stuff is happening here that's changing this uh, cell geometry. Uh, from something simple like that to something more like a fried egg like that one. 
And so, and then we've got calcification taking place, and uh, we've got these cells that uh, come from the bone marrow that can be osteoplastic or they can be osteoblastic, and they have either pathway they can take, and here's an osteoblastic pathway. Here's the activation of becoming an osteoclast, and so, uh, and that's how bone is made and used in coronary arteries as the cement of the coronary artery is bone. It's hydroxyapatite that's being formed in the wall of the vessel, and it goes from the outside in. From the outside in is the formation of the bone, and uh, we can show you fine examples of that. And so this study of the origin and features of calcifying cells found in blood vessel shows how uh, calcium buildup occurs in atherosclerosis and helps us understand how we can reverse that, how cells are bi-directional. And so that's pretty much uh, this story. And so, uh, Pooh, where do we go from here? We, we, uh, we found this and we're not sure exactly what that means. What do you think? It's MRI. Yeah, you saw, MRI. You saw that I popped over for an MRI. I'm not sure that's going to help me, though. But, uh, but we did it. So let's go look. This is an imaging conference, and so MRI seems uh, like something that's helped me in the past. And so let's go look and see what our MRI looked at, looked like. Into soft, soft read, and let's uh, see what those look like. And so this is what they look like. And we're looking for homogeneous myocardial perfusion. This is a Lexiscan dynamic study. It looks pretty homogeneous. I don't see any perfusion defects. We didn't expect that because we're not obstructing the lumen. We just have a very nicely positive remodeled vessel. And so let's go take a look at something else. And watch it beep. And so, it's got nice contract too. The right side looks good. So if we're worried about arrhythmogenic right ventricular dysplasia, uh, the right side is not dilated. We can look for uh, fat over there if we want to. We can do an OPIP. Look for fat. We can look for fat in the outflow track. There's not a hint of anything wrong with that RV. And there's the left hand here descending. You're not going to see calcification because, uh, well, you can look at the spine. You don't see calcification with MRI. So we're not going to see that. You see uh, that the right ventricle looks fine. It's not dilated. It has normal contractility. It doesn't have any fat in it. Here's the spleen again. We're not going to see calcium in the spleen with this. As it gets loaded here, and let's go through the series. And we can look at contractility. And we can see the torsion. There's a little torsion. We can watch this work its way through from the base to the apex, both the left ventricle and the right ventricle. And it's, uh, it looks very, very, very nice. And this is what we use for calculating our ejection fraction, which was normal in this patient. Pop this up. Nice contractility. Looks great. And uh, nothing from the MRI. So now let's get to uh, what should we do about this patient? And uh, the question is, do we put them on a statin drug? And so tell me, uh, Pooh, would you use a statin drug in this patient? He had some calcium, so if we're sure that's like kind of calcium, then yeah, starting more to hurt. 
as long as it doesn't have side effects. And you can tolerate it, I would start. So conventional wisdom, this is what statins look like. And uh, some of them are a little different. Here's mevastatin, which one of the early ones, lovastatin, simvastatin, probastatin, some of the early drugs. And you can see uh, how different they are. Not a lot of difference in these molecules. Seems to make a little difference. But let's take a look at uh, our patient. And uh, basically, at age 33, he's 34 now, at age 33, we said, well, let's do a CT. Let's do a single rotation of the gantry and get a placogram and pull that out and compare it. And uh, we compared it, you know, probably segment by segment. And there's actually, there's no change at all in this um, particular plaque. And so do we call this, is this a plaque? Is this atherosclerosis? What do we call this in our little guy here? And so let's look and talk about this. And so he's got Markley abnormal EKG. Okay, sure does. He's got an LAD, septal side, proximal linear coronary calcification with market positive remodeling, about 30%. He's got parenchymal pulmonary calcifications. Now we found some calcifications in the spleen. It has no progressive changes. Would you call this atherosclerosis? Well, you know, by definition, an atheroma is degeneration of the walls of the arteries caused by the accumulation of fatty deposits and scar tissue and leading to restriction of the circulation and risk of thrombosis. So I see no restriction. I see no risk of thrombosis. I don't see any fatty deposits. I don't see any scar tissue. All I see is a linear coronary calcification. It looks very neat. Uh, fatty material that forms plaques in the arteries. Where's the fatty material? So uh, what do we call this, Pooh? I just called it coronary intimal or maybe adventitial. Probably be maybe adventitial calci calciopathy. And so what do you think about this, Pooh? I don't think we have an answer on this, gentleman. Yeah. Very interesting, huh? Yeah, is all that's calcium in the wall of a vessel at the Romanist disease? Are we uh, deluded in believing that because of all the patients that we see that have at the Romanist disease? Could this have been a trauma? Could he have had a, a compression wave that went through his chest on a traumatic event, and he got uh, some traumatic injury to the lung as well as to the LAD on the septal side and reacted to it by calcification. You know, well, you know, we asked him if he's had any exposure to explosives. He's been uh, in uh, Iraq or Afghanistan. He hasn't. He has nothing that he can recall. And so I don't know what to call this. And you can't call it a syndrome because you only got one case. And so, but it's very, very particular and certainly a very abnormal EKG. Where do we see EKGs that look like that? We see the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, but he's reached the age that that would uh, unveil itself as a, as a, uh, as basically we would start seeing uh, the expression of those genes. And so we don't see that. Uh, does he have a, uh, Apical hypertrophy, I don't see that. Does he have um, an apical displacement of a papillary muscle, which can give EKG changes like that? No, he doesn't have that. And so we stopped his statin drug, which he had been taking, because I don't have a good reason to give it. So we stopped that. Uh, and uh, we've been following him longitudinally. He's 34 years old now, started when he's 31. And he's had no change, and he's doing fine. And uh, there's been no progression of any of this. And so uh, I leave you with uh, the end of the mystery case today. And uh, I don't know what uh, exactly uh, was his problem, but uh, perhaps I think a new syndrome. I think that Watson's a little doubtful about that here, about a new syndrome. And so uh, I thank you for attending. And uh, don't have the answer 
uh, to this mystery case. And uh, don't think that there's a mosquito-borne disease that I can account for because it doesn't seem like chimichanga, doesn't look like dinghy, and doesn't look like Zika. So that's the end of our story today. Thank you for attending. And uh, the mystery case remains a mystery. And sometimes cases do that. They remain a mystery. And we don't have the answer. So if we do get an answer, if you have any ideas in the future, please uh, share them with me. Uh, because uh, this is a case that still remains a mystery, but it's benign. He's doing well. So thank you very much for attending today. And we'll see you next week. Thank you. Bye bye, Pooh. Bye, Mary. Bye, Teresa. Bye. Bye, Melody and uh, folks at Largo. Talk to you later. <laughs>